Hey there. Um, I have a few things to talk about. Uh, I uh, am writing. Okay, so as far as books are concerned, I'm always giving updates. I am editing the Romans messages. Anytime I see someone struggling with sin and plaguing sin and besetting sin, I send them to my Romans playlist and I say, especially listen to the messages on Romans 6 through 8 which is the science of how the Lord sets us on a path to freedom from sin's lordship uh, over us, the, its dominion over us, which operates in a way that we're kind of surprised by because it's not uh, actually sin's power per se that's our problem. It's sin deceiving us through the power of the law. And it's really our death with the law, death to the law through Christ's death, our death with him to the law's demand that eventually is the key to being freed from sin. So that's why Romans 6.14 says, uh, sin shall not lord it over you, for you no longer under law, but under grace, right? But I did a Romans series on... Uh, one through eight specifically. I never type the messages for all the way up to chapter 11. I may, but um, f one through four focuses on justification in heaven before God. What happened? What is the significance of the blood of Jesus Christ being offered in heaven? And that's Paul's gospel unique. It's the fifth gospel because you don't see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke or even John, you don't see a testimony of the propitiation, the declaration of God's righteousness uh, put on display in the heavens to silence the mouth of all accusation um, and to put God's righteousness on display on those who believe and to credit righteousness to us uh, and to manifest Christ as our righteousness. That all happened in the heavens when Christ entered with his blood. And that's where Paul's gospel picks up. Romans 3, uh, specifically, you know, but Romans 1 through 4 is Christ as our righteousness in the heavens. And then part 2 is Christ as our life, as the Spirit. Christ as our life on earth. And that has to do with the mystery that Paul is given to reveal about the spirit of sonship in us, that we were crucified with Christ and that Christ's life is now in us um, and how that life works. And it's not a religious text. It's a science book. Uh, <laughs> Romans 5 through 8 is the scientific metaphysical principles of how the law of sin and the law of uh, death and the law of good in our mind and the law of the spirit of life in Christ have all worked to bring us into a crisis um, to transfer us through the death of Christ out of Adam and into Christ and then in our experience the crisis to bring us out of the mind of the flesh and into the mind of the spirit out of the spirit of uh, bondage and fear and condemnation and into the liberty, the spirit of sonship. Um, and it's all very good news. And I, uh, this is Paul's gospel, you know. It is a gospel. People don't understand that Romans is a gospel. And Romans is the fifth gospel. And Romans is Paul's gospel. And it's on the basis of the doctrine in Romans that we take our cues and interpret the whole Bible. And uh, it's interesting that Romans is placed right after the book of Acts, which is the story of how Paul uh, ends up in prison, headed to Rome, to answer for the charges of being a divisive plague uh, because there's this little group of Jews that followed him all around uh, everywhere he went and stirred up riots and then blamed it on him, you know, but 
the reason they were able to convince everybody that he was a problem, even the churches. So at the end of his ministry, he said, all the churches in Asia have departed from me. That was because of the work of these evil religious zealots was because the church had a hard time, especially the church in Jerusalem, receiving the fifth gospel. They knew about Jesus' earthly ministry and understood as far as Matthew, Mark, and Luke spoke about how he had gone about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. And then he died for our sins and he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. But they did not understand, really, the propitiation, uh, the display of God's righteousness in heaven, the manifestation of Christ as our righteousness in the heavens, Romans 1 through 3. And they didn't understand Christ as our life here on the earth and our death with Christ uh, to the old creation and our death to the law as the means to dealing with sin. Um, and are living to God through Christ as the means, and walking in the Spirit as the means to living Christ, you know, living a Christian life. They still mixed Jesus with the law, and they were loyal to the temple, they were loyal to Moses, and they were loyal to, uh, you know, they were still meeting in the temple. Um, that's why Galatians was written, that's why Hebrews was written, right? Um, they were still confused. And that caused a lot of problems, which was the reason for the disputations and the conference in Acts 15. And then that confusion was still not resolved 20 years later in Acts 21, when Paul ends up in Jerusalem, uh, knowing that bonds and afflicted waiting for him. Prophets told him and the Spirit told him that he was going to be delivered over the Gentiles, but he knew that was for the gospel's sake. And when he got there, the brothers in the church told him he needed to take a vow in the temple to prove he had not apostatized from Moses and walked orderly keeping the law. I mean, at that point, something's wrong. You know, this is the church telling him to do that. If you understand Paul's doctrine, you know that the things are not right in Jerusalem. And that's what caused all the problems and that's what opened the door for the Judaizers and the tares to come in and circulate freely among the churches because people were not clear. Uh, so that's really what the story of the book of Acts is all about. It's not just about the miracles, it's about the trouble. And it's about, it's actually Luke was preparing Paul's trial documents. That's what Acts is. Um, so Romans, even though it was written 10 or 15 years before the book of Acts was completed, appears right after the book of Acts as if the Holy Spirit is saying, you need to understand this background. And you need to understand that this is the revelation, this is the gospel that they couldn't receive. And this is why they had so many problems. you know. And that is where we are today. We have inherited... A religion called Christianity that has its roots in that confusion. And we're still surrounded by it. And it always comes back to a rejection of the fifth gospel. All problems in my Christian life and in everybody's Christian life that I know of who ever got clear and had what you would call a revival where they went from being backslidden, feeling condemned, Useless before God, powerless, uh, futile, to actually becoming effective and free in Christ and knowing the truths of their identity with Christ and seeing who they are in Christ came from Romans, then Galatians, and then start seeing Ephesians, Colossians. You know, some Hebrew, Hebrews is deep too. All these books are good, but Romans is the path in. You've got to get, you're not going to get freedom from the things that plague you without Romans. And you're not going to get freedom from the religious environment 
without understanding Paul's gospel. Uh, there's a few people on my channel right now who many would call Lord Shippers, but they're actually open. They're actually, you know, open to the truth and receiving. They just, this is their background and, and they're learning, you know. Well, all I could do is point them to Romans. So I point them to the Romans playlist. So as you can see, I'm kind of excited about Romans coming out. I'm excited about all books, you know. Anytime a book is coming, that's good. And be, uh, so, I don't know, in the next couple months, I'll have edited this and put it into a print format, and I'm excited about that. But then I'm also typing the first John messages. And uh, so I was typing today, and that was getting me excited. Because... Uh, First John really has to do with why I started my channel. And First John is written to believers so that they can be perfected in the love of God, so that they can be in the know they're in the fellowship, know they have eternal life, that their joy can be full, so they can be perfected in the love of God for the purpose of their confidence in the day of judgment. The first John is written to the last day's church in the time of apostasy with the expectation that Christ is coming. Uh, they're being seduced by antichrists who are taking the way of Cain. And they need, they, they, this seduction is an attack on their conscience and they need to know how to determine the difference between the truth and the error. And the answer is what he calls to abide in Christ, which is not something mystical, but that which you heard from the beginning, let it abide in you. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will continue in the Father and the Son. And the reason we want to abide in him, he says, is now little children abide in him so that when he appears... You may have confidence that it's coming and not shrink back in shame. And uh, so it's written to the end times church anticipating the Lord's coming. And it's for the preparation of their conscience that they can be perfected in the love of God, which casts out all fear so that they can have boldness in the day of judgment. God's expecting a group of people to boldly greet him. Christ is expecting a group of people whose issues of conscience have been resolved through the gospel that they can boldly greet him when he comes with a smile on their face. That is the apostles' hope. That was all the apostles' hope. If you look through the epistles, you'll see that that was the focus of the labor of Paul and uh, Jude you know, Jude says it this way, be diligent to be found in him without spot, building yourself up in your most holy faith, keeping yourself in the love of God and looking for the mercy that is appearing. And Paul says in Philippians, you know, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all wisdom and discernment that you may approve by testing the things which different are more excellent so that you may be sincere and without offense in the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And when we study that, we talk about how it all comes down to being able to discern between truth and error so that you can approve that which is excellent with a good conscience um, for your joy to be full. And the spots, to be without spot, has to do with you've overcome the false teachings that are a Antichrist attack on your conscience. And 1 John deals with that specifically. That the seducers, the Antichrists, are walking in darkness. They talk an awful lot about Jesus, but they reject God's way of justifying sinners, which is the propitiation, the blood, which manifests his righteousness, which you just talked about in Romans you know, 1 through 3. Uh, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. He's our advocate. And uh, he justifies those who believe in him. And Abel's offering 
prove that he was justified, and he looked forward to that propitiation. Cain's offering proved that he was not, because he rejected God's way of justifying sinners. And when he was rejected, because he offered the fruit of the cursed ground, which signified the works of the flesh, from his toil and the sweat uh, of his brow, he was rejected, his countenance fell. God gave him space to repent, but that uh, led to him murdering Abel. And that's the story, that's the heart of 1 John. Uh, all Everything comes out of Cain and Abel in 1 John. And Cain is the example of what it means to walk in the darkness and hate your brethren while saying you walk in the light and love God. You walk in the, you say you walk in the light, you say you abide in Christ, you say you have fellowship with God, but actually the truth does not abide in you. You reject the propitiation, you hate the brethren, which means specifically you refuse Christ as the propitiation. So it's two sides of the same coin to the new commandment, which is true in you uh, and in Christ because the darkness is past and the true light now shines, is to believe on Jesus Christ and to love the brethren, not as Cain, who hated his brother because he was of the evil one and his brother's deeds were righteous and his were evil. Abel's deed was his offering. And Cain's deed at that time was his offering. Abel's deed was righteous, and uh, Cain's deed was uh, unrighteous, evil, right, at that time. And then they, th it went manifested further. It was a sin unto death. He ended up killing Abel. But Jesus said Abel was righteous, and Jesus said he was a prophet. He was slain at the altar. And Abel's deed showed his faith. He was justified by his faith. Really, the faith is what his practice of righteousness is. He believed in the seed of the woman, and he believed in the blood. And Abel could not recognize him. He hated him. Why? Because he hated God's way of justifying sinners. He thought he should have been received on the basis of his offering, which was his works. He dug in that ground and toiled and brought forth the fruit of the ground. And how many pastors have said, Abel didn't do his best? No, that's not it at all. Abel brought the first, or Cain didn't do his best. Abel brought the firstling of the flock with the fat portion. That's why he was accepted. He was a shepherd because he had a vision of what God required to justify sinners. And that's always been the case. That's our righteousness. Um, but the antichrists who take the way of Cain, he calls, they're the ones who seduce you. And he says, I'm not writing these things because you don't know God or don't know the truth. I'm writing them because you do know God. I've written these things to you because you know him who's the beginning. I've written these things because this, you're strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have an anointing from the Holy One. And the new commandment is true in you. And the darkness is past and the true light now shines. Uh, I'm writing to you concerning those who seduce you. So John is not writing to tell you how to walk in love or how to have fellowship. John is writing you to tell you these antichrists who are seducing you are not your brothers. They never were of us. They went out from us. But when they go out, they don't disappear. They stay to seduce. How do they seduce? By damaging your conscience. See, the Antichrist develop false doctrine about Christ that is full of boasts. You know, if we say we love God but hate our brother, we lie. If we say we have no sin, we lie. If we say we're walking in the light, uh, but hate the brethren, we're walking in darkness even now. He keeps saying all the way through 1 John, if we say, if we say. Why? Because the seducers, the antichrists, who deny Christ as the propitiation and hate the brethren, are full of these boasts. 
And through their boasts, they establish themselves as a spiritual authority while leveling accusations at the saints, refusing to recognize them as the sons of God. So 1 John 4 and 5 make it real clear that, you know, here's how you know you're a son of God and that you have eternal life. You believe God's record concerning his son. Whoever believes that record has the testimony in himself because uh, the spirit is the one that testifies. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And this is he who came by water and by blood. And he's saying, look, he didn't just come in the flesh. He came by blood. And if you reject the fact that he came by blood, he says not by water only, but by water and by blood. He says it twice. If you say that he came by water only, which is to come by the flesh, and not by blood, you deny his work. He's not only the Son of God, he's also the Christ. You have to believe both. The Christ means he actually accomplished the work. And the Antichrists deny they're subtle. They claim to know Jesus. They talk about Jesus seemingly more than you do. But instead of speaking about his work, they talk about your works and their works. And they use their boasts to seduce you and then level accusations at you to destabilize your conscience. And what is it? It's an attack on your conscience and an attack on your confidence so that you'll shrink back in the day of judgment. And what is the answer? Well, you've received an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, and you don't need any of these people to teach you, but the anointing will teach you to abide in Him. What does it mean to abide? And this is not a mystical thing. The, uh, I think I'm going to call this book uh, mm, Demystifying John so that we can have confidence or something. But he says, if that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also may have uh, will abide in the Father and in the Son. It means holding on to the message and not being moved away from it. And John refers to the message again and again and again. He starts the book with that which is from the beginning, which we heard, which we handled, which our eyes have seen uh, concerning the word of life, right? And the life was manifested and we've seen and declare that life. And we declare these things to you so that you may have fellowship with us for our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And we write these things that your joy may be full. And he tells us later, we write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. He is not writing these things so that you would question whether you have eternal life. And if you read First John in a way that makes you think that you don't have eternal life, and you come away from it not having a heart full of joy and not sensing the fellowship, then you've misinterpreted or not read it right. So... We went through 1 John to diffuse all the different stumbling blocks and misinterpretations that have been put there, by the way, by the Antichrist teaching system. That book has become a landmine, a, a, a minefield that people are scared to even read it. I used to be scared to read it because there seem to be so many accusations in it, and it's because of the Antichrist and their teaching. Uh, you know... We've been told that that book addresses Gnostic doctrine that says Christ didn't come in the flesh and that's what it's all about. No. It addresses legalism. The root of the issue is Cain's sin. Cain believed in God just like Abel did. Cain knew an offering was required just like Abel did. He knew who Jehovah was. It wasn't a question of anything other than what does God require to deal with man? How does he accept man? That's the root of the question in 1 John. The center of gravity for 1 John is 1 John 3. We love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and slew his brother. Why did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And then from that, John defines what is righteousness, who's of the devil, who is of God, how we know. Okay? Hating the brother is Cain. Walking in darkness is Cain. Professing to know God while hating the brother is Cain. Seeking to be justified by your own works and saying you have no sin is Cain. 
Practicing righteousness is a matter of believing in Jesus Christ as the propitiation of your sin. That's Abel, and it's represented by his offering, and that's why he was accepted. And that's how we accept each other, and that's how God accepts us, and that's how we know each other. And John is saying, look, these are not your brothers, and you have an anointing that's going to teach you to abide in him. And as we learn to abide in the truth, and we learn that God is not the one leveling these accusations at us, and we learn to interpret the Bible in the light of Paul's gospel, which is what John is based on, we learn to uh, interpret everything in the light of what the ascended Christ revealed that he had accomplished in his death and resurrection. And we don't stop at the law of Moses, and we don't stop at the synoptic gospels, but we go all the way to Christ seated at the right hand of God, being made a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, our advocate, our friend, our bridegroom, who's coming without sin unto salvation to those who look for him, who is coming to greet us in the heavens and present us to the Father as the trophy of his work. Where's not a beating or a whipping post waiting for us when he comes? How much, I've used this example before, but if you're a bridegroom and you're standing down at the altar and here comes the bride and she's crying and she's having to be dragged down to the front and she keeps trying to run away and you find out it's because the bridesmaids told her that when she gets down there, she's going to be married to someone who's going to immediately take her off and criticize her dress inspect her life, inspect everything she's ever said, tell her she's ugly, and beat her, and then she can be married. She's not going to be looking forward to her wedding night. How much would that hurt you that you've been lied to, lied about like that, right? That's what's happening. And so, you know, I'm a prophetic person. I studied the Bible prophecy, and I've lived because since of being a Christian that the Lord is coming, but most of my Christian life, teaching about prophecy was filled with fear. I was talking to Renee that rolled the other day. She's not a dispensationalist. And one of the reasons she doesn't really buy into the uh, futuristic aspect of all the prophecy stuff, and she does, she's not 100% decided, but she's like, there's just so much fear porn. She said, you know, the Puritans, uh, Jonathan Edwards... Sinners in an angry of a, hands of an angry God, and people used to flock to that stuff. It might as well have been the Nightmare on Elm Street. It was the horror movies of the day, and Christians have spun that stuff up about the tribulation and all that stuff for entertainment. What has that done to people's conscience who are afraid? A lot of Christians believe that the reason people aren't interested. And the Lord's coming in Christianity is because they're lukewarm. No, the reason anybody is not interested in the Lord's coming is because their conscience causes them to shrink back. And a lot of people who say they're really interested in the Lord's coming are actually terrified. They are morbidly fascinated with it. They're the same kind of people that are watching dreams of hell videos most of them a lot of them end up concluding in partial rapture work sanctification almost all the channels that broadcast that stuff end up either broadcasting a works back loaded gospel or endorsing those who do and castigating those who defend the true gospel so of course people are going to have a stigma against bible prophecy you know these prophetic channels where are their studies and teachings on John, uh, on, I'm sorry, on Daniel 9 and the prophetic passages. That, that, that's not what we're seeing, you know. Ezekiel 36, what is our, how do we know that Israel being in the land is significant? How do we know Israel is going to be grafted back in? How can I even have that conversation with you when there's so much hysteria around it, you know? And meanwhile, the Lord is wanting us to be confident that it is coming, perfected in the love of God. If you really believe Jesus is coming, 
You should be being perfected in the love of God and letting his love cast out all fear so that you can have confidence. And I believe that, uh, you know, since Adam, the fall, um, since the knowledge of the tree of, tree of knowledge of good and evil, man has intuitively shrank back from the presence of glory. You know, when God came through the garden, Adam and Eve hid, right? Shame, condemnation, a spirit of bondage and fear. Well, we've been not been given a spirit of bondage and fear, but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. But we need to learn to walk in the spirit. And that's what Romans 8 is about. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus does set me free from the law of sin and death. And there is no condemnation for those who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But it's the mind that's set on the uh, spirit that's life and peace. The mind set on the flesh is death. I need to learn to agree with the Spirit's witness concerning who I am in Christ. And who, what is the rapture? What is he coming back for? So a few years ago, before I even started my channel, I wrote some things, uh, which I can't seem to find, but one of them was, the rapture of the church is a joyful event not to be feared. And I talked about how the church is the masterpiece of God. It's the inheritance of Christ. And when he receives the church, it's the bride. He loved, him, he loved the church and gave himself for her that he may present her to himself without spot, right? Uh, through the what? Washing of the water of the word. He sanctifies us in the knowledge of the truth. Not by demanding that you be holy, but by saturating you with the knowledge of his love. Christ making his home in your heart through faith that you may be rooted and grounded in love that you may know what is the breadth and length and height and to depth and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled unto the fullness of God. That's how he sanctifies his bride. Um, <laughs> not by beating her and telling her to shape up. So I, I said, you know, and I used Hebrews where it says, he says, I will declare thy, I will declare thy name to the brethren. And, and I will sing your praises in the midst of the congregation. And behold, I and the children you've given me. And this is the Christ who's not ashamed to call us brethren. Presenting us in the heavens as the trophy of his finished work to the Father before the angels. Ephesians says that this will be the manifestation of the multifarious wisdom of God to the principalities. And Romans 8 says the entire creation groans for the manifestation of the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay, that day is the greatest day in the universe. It's the purpose for which the creation was made. When the Father, you know, Paul prays that we receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of Him, that we may know the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of of his inheritance in the saints. And then he talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. So it's his inheritance, right? Uh, which he operated in Christ, the power, which made Christ head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, Christ, who fills all in all. Christ is pleased to receive the church as his body. When he, the rapture is different, and, and this is one of the things that the prophecy study is supposed to do. The reason the brethren studied prophecy was not to become Bible prophecy enthusiasts. When you go back and study the origins of dispensationalism, you'll see that they were concerned, Schofield said it this way, that the church had been entirely Galatianized and that the law and the gospel were uh, mixed into an inco incoherent system. Law was not given its proper place be, as a ministry of condemnation and death to lead us to despair so that we would lean on Christ because we were taught that we should keep it and by the Holy Spirit's help we may. Right? And that was because the church did not know how to distinguish between Israel and the church and thought that the church was under the law for the rule of life. So that's what they were teaching back then. It was Calvinism, which is the lordship salvation of the day. Lordship salvation today is just Calvinism, really. 
and Calvinism uh, and amillennialism and replacement theology all just is Catholicism, which is the church has replaced Israel. The church has been grafted into Israel. The church is Israel. This is the kingdom. And therefore, everything that applied to Israel applies to us today. And there's no vision. There's no knowledge of Paul's gospel. There's quotes from it, but there's no understanding of it. So the way we live the Christian life is not a matter of our identification with Christ. Um, it is worked out by law keeping. All right. Well, what does that do? That strengthens sin and ensures that strength, uh, the sin is the strength in my life. Puts me under the law, puts me under condemnation, and guarantees, if I stay in that place, that I will shrink back. I do believe, G Peter said it this way, you have a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in the darkness until the day star breaks and the uh, day star or the day breaks and the day star rises in your heart. Uh, Paul said there's going to come a day when Christ comes to be admired in all the saints because you believed our testimony. And he was talking about receiving Paul's words as scripture in context in Thessalonians. Jesus said, hold fast to what you have. Let no one steal your crown. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not do lie. Come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. And he said, if you overcome, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of God and you will no, go, no more go out. We all want to abide, okay, to stay in our fixed position found in Christ, not having a righteousness of our own consisting of the law keeping. But that which is out of God and based on faith, knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, recognizing God is not expecting something from me. He's expecting something from Christ in me. I, through the law, died to the law. Uh, that I might live unto God, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. That is the key to joy in the Christian life, to recognize that God's not expecting something from me. Okay. Now, only a ministry that works with that kind of truth is building with gold, silver, and precious stones. And if you want to talk about rewards, you've got to talk about God's building. you got to go to 1 Corinthians 3. And it says that the day is going to declare all the works that have been wrought because everything that is wood, hay, and stubble will have been burned off. It doesn't say Christ is going to burn it. It says the day is going to declare it. What day? The day when we're transfigured and only that which is incorruptible remains. Right? The incorruptible materials, the gold, silver, and the precious stones, Peter defines those things for us. I'm not trying to get into it all here, but those things have to do with the gospel, which produces confidence that allows people to stand in a rejoicing manner before the Lord and not shrink back in shame. Because they know that Christ is their uh, position before God, not their own uh Nakedness or whatever, you know, Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. That represents religion trying to cover the flesh and its nakedness. But God killed a lamb, first death, instead of their substitutionary offering, and covered them with its skins. Presumably they were now able to walk before God. We need to put on Christ so that we can stand in the presence of God today. If you can stand confidently before him today, then there's no reason to think that you would shrink back in shame when he comes. And I do believe that there will be some who are Christians who will not, it's not that anything will happen to them. Their own flesh, if it's the dominant thing, when he is manifested, their response, their first response will be an inkling of condemnation. It'll be like the bride going down the bride, uh, bridal, uh, you know, the, the carpet's out, bridegroom's standing there, she finally sees him, and she starts crying. Why does she start crying? Because she's been told all these horrible things and she's afraid he's going to beat her. Okay? So, we need, what's the antidote? 
What would be the antidote in that situation? Well, she needs to learn the truth. If he's not like that, she needs to... Maybe she kind of had a mix. Some of the bridesmaids told her she, he was abusive. Others told her he was the nicest guy in the history of the world. What would be the way for her to know? Well, maybe instead of spending all her time planning the wedding for the last year and figuring out, you know, who was going to be in the pictures and who got to be a bridesmaid and who got... Maybe she should have spent that getting to know him, <laughs> right? Then she wouldn't be afraid. It's growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is our path to confidence. And it comes not through anything but the gospel. The gospel announces him. And I said to somebody, you know, on my channel just yesterday, he said, uh, okay, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. But I started listening to all these different teachers and now all I feel is condemnation. And I said... Well, first of all, it's not what you feel, it's what you believe. You feel a certain way because you believe a certain thing, you know. Second of all, uh, the reason you're under condemnation is because you've been told that believing the gospel is one thing and living the Christian life is something else. So you got saved by believing the gospel, and then helpful Christians came along and said, okay, now you believe the gospel. Jesus rose from your dead. And he rose, you know, he died for your sins and rose from the dead. Now you need to get on to living the Christian life. They got your eyes off of Christ and onto all kinds of things, which is called Galatian error. Having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? All right. And that all is in the flesh, which is since Adam gripped with the spirit of bondage of fear. It's all of the law, which is the strength of sin. So the only feelings you're going to get from that realm, no matter how good you do in it, is condemnation and fear. <laughs> or self-righteousness, but usually the people that come to me are on the fear side of it. You know. So what is the answer then? Well, that's what 1 John was written for, that which was in the beginning. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, his goal is to restore them back to what they had in the beginning as the source of their confidence. But that which we heard from the beginning is so much more than we thought it was. Because it's, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And according to the scriptures speaks volumes. Because according to the scriptures, he accomplished so much in his death and resurrection it's not just that he forgave my sins and I'm going to heaven for now. It's not just a snack that I ate at the beginning and now i got to figure out something else. See, a lot of people say, well, he keeps talking about preaching the gospel to yourself. How many times can I say that? <laughs> That's, the gospel is the riches of Christ. All the things that he has accomplished for me and what I have been uh, brought into as a result He's transferred me out of darkness. I'm no longer of the darkness. I'm not in the darkness. I'm in the light. His light is shining on me. Not only that, but he's smiling at me. I, I told this guy, I said, you know, the, the gospel is not just that you're going to heaven, and yet he may be mad at you today. The gospel is not only are you going to heaven, but he's smiling at you. And it's almost impossible to get that smile off his face. And you can access him right now. And you should until the smile on his face is filling your heart with joy. That's what we need. We need to know our bridegroom. And we don't. And see, even if I say you need to know him, that produces demand. And you go, yeah, I'm not reading my Bible like I should. <laughs> I'm not praying like I should. I'm not going to church like I should. What is that? That is a sense of debt because you think your works are going to get you there. No. The way we know him is by believing the gospel. Instead of saying, yeah, I'm not doing the things I should, we should say, praise God to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is kind of unright as, as righteousness. I am ungodly. I don't read the Bible enough. I don't, I'm not spiritual enough. I don't pray enough. I am prideful, and when I'm humble, it's false, whatever. 
You know, all the different things they accuse me of are true. And yet, God has justified me. And I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. By faith in his blood, I have access by faith into this grace in which I stand. And I have the ability now to draw near by the blood of Christ, clothed with Christ. And he loves me, and he gave himself for me. And he's pleased with me, and I'm a fragrance of Christ unto God, and I'm accepted in the beloved. We have to learn to be renewed in these truths until our heart overflows with them. That's all it means. It's not you need to pray more, you need to seek more, you need to learn more. It's you need, uh, you're going to be miserable unless you take what you've received and look at it. You know, and the reason you don't look at it, the reason you don't read the Bible enough, the reason you don't pray enough is because you look at it as a demand and immediately start feeling guilty. And when you feel guilty, you hide from God. See, the uh, condemnation produces death because you stay away from the presence of God. You hide when he comes around. Oh, I better hide. I'm naked. I better hide. I haven't read my Bible in a week. I better hide I haven't prayed in several days. Okay? And you have the Spirit in you. So every time the Lord wakes up and you know tries to stir you up inside, your flesh is going to fight it and say, Ugh. you will feel condemnation with his encouragement. We are a mix. We have a treasure in an earthen vessel. The answer is to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and learn to fight. We have to recognize that there's a warfare going on. And we've been given the sword of the Spirit. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty to God. To the pulling down of strongholds, and that we cast down vain uh, imaginations and every lofty thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, what kind of thoughts are those? They're images of a false Christ who's waiting at the end of the bridal processional with a whipping post. There's people that actually teach that. And it's because they're confusing the judgment seats. You know, they're, they're taking things from parables, by the way, which are illustration of spiritual principles, not something we should generate literal doctrine from, number one. Number two, they're confusing Christ's coming to judge the nations with a rule of iron, which will be a strict judgment, and his coming in the air... Uh, to greet his bride, the many sons of God who've been conformed to the image of Christ and glorified, who were a mystery hidden in God's heart, not revealed until after his death and resurrection, specifically through Paul. You don't see the church and her judgment seat in the heavens, her bema seat, her, give, her, her rejoicing celebration of rewards, until Paul. You're not going to find that in the Gospels. People try to mix the judgments that Jesus spoke about, the glorious throne, the Davidic throne, and the judgment of the sheep and goat nations for their treatment of the Jews during the tribulation uh, with the church. And that's, okay, so I've been on a tangent, but that's why the brethren were raised up. to dis The reason prophecy, Bible prophecy started, that study, was simply to discern the difference between Israel and the church so that the church could be brought more fully into the knowledge of grace. And if you go back and read the brethren, that's what they were concerned with. C.H. McIntosh, Darby, H.A. Ironside, Schofield, their concern was much more about how the Christian is not under law than about the various things about the rapture. If they talked about the rapture, it was how I'm talking about it. It wasn't, oh, and all the earth is going to be wiped out and planes are going to crash in the air and the Nephilim are going to come out and uh, here, watch this movie. This will scare the crap out of you. No. It was about, okay, the church's destiny is far more glorious than that of Israel. She has a earthly covenant called the New Covenant it is glorious, and the nations have a destiny before her, and there will be a judgment where the sheep and goats are separated, but the church will have been conformed to the image of Christ and glorified. That's called the 
rapture and it was a secret a mystery that's how they studied it and that's how they spoke about it the brethren would roll in their graves to see the so-called descendants the prophecies watchmen today and unfortunately it's too bad because now nobody reads the brethren so they don't know how precious this truth is you know they've ne people haven't done a real study of this kind of stuff they guys think i'm so great you know i went through the uh louis ray schaefer basic bible themes where i talked about some of these distinctions they're like this is the best stuff i've ever heard and it's like well that's really sad <laughs> you know it's not uh we're standing on the shoulder there's some great stuff now you have to sort through it because our knowledge of grace has grown quite a bit and our language and our vocabulary is up to date but that was the pursuit of the brethren and people said there no one's really improved on that 150 years later, you know. Um, that's the origin of prophecy study. And I was a prophecy person before I had my uh, channel. And the reason I started my channel, one of them, the, the sense I had was that, you know, God wants people confident unto the day of judgment. And for that, there are problems in our concepts around justification, sanctification, and reward that bring people under condemnation, bring them under law righteousness, and produce fear related to his coming. Why am I speaking all this? I believe he is coming. I don't talk about it that much anymore because of all the hysteria related to the rapture stuff that's been going on for the last couple of years. Doesn't mean I've stopped watching and stopped believing, but the way to watch is to guard your crown. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, let no one steal your crown. And when he talked in the gospel about uh, watching, remember he said, If the good man of the house knew when his master was coming, he would have watched so that no one would have broken into the house to steal the treasure, right? Jesus is going to steal us because we're the treasure. The world is going to be like, Where'd they go? You know. But we have a treasure that we're to watch and it's called the gospel and it's our crown it's our confidence and our joy and our rejoicing and it's in holding that and there's thieves and robbers which jesus said have come in to the sheepfold by another way other than him the door and they come in with their own speaking because he said a sheep eventually won't hear them so they must be speaking right how do they steal well paul said don't let anyone carry you off as spoil through his philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, philosophy of this world, the elements of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Uh, and then he says, let no one judge you unworthy of your reward or count you unworthy of your prize by making you subject to their religion. Right? And the, and the religion has to do with do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All that stuff has an appearance of religion, but it's of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. How can we actually deal with what's in my heart? Well, we reckon ourselves dead, and we set our mind on those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, knowing that when he appears, uh, we'll appear with him in glory, and knowing that our life is hid with Christ in God. We're not looking for manifestation on this earth. We're looking by faith at Christ, who is our life, and we recognize it's hidden. John says something similar in 1 John. He says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, only that it's not manifested what we will be. We know when we see him, we'll be as he is. And the reason the Antichrist don't recognize us as the sons of God is because they're looking not at our profession of what we believe, the gospel, but at our so-called fruit for manifestations of righteousness, which Paul said, look, we're crucified. We're not looking in that realm. And they're going to try to steal your crown by carrying you off as spoil. And that's what happened to that guy who said, I'm under condemnation, is he started well in the Christian life, but then somebody came along and said, okay, you believe the gospel, now you need to get on with the Christian life, let me show you how, and carried him off as spoil. We need to guard our treasure. And we've all been carried off as spoil. Now we need to come back, like John says, to that which we heard from the beginning. 
and fight for it and contend for it, you know. That's why this channel exists. So I just wanted to share that because I'm writing First John and it's just like bringing the, the strategic, this is what we're doing. It's not without a purpose. It's not like, well, I just happen to be like talking about righteousness. You know, it's strategic. I believe we're up pushing up against that time and there's been a real systematic unveiling of the truth where Christ has been seen to be our righteousness, our sanctification, and our reward. We've, we've covered all those topics very systematically to help free the condemnation, get the condemnation off people's back so that they're standing confidently before the Lord. There's a reason for that. There's going to be a smiling bride, you know. It's not that there's, everybody's going to get raptured, okay? It's not a partial rapture. But we want to be, uh, Paul prayed, you see his labor. Uh, you'll see that there is the possibility of when we enter his presence, What what is the condition he finds us in? Without spot, hopefully, rejoicing. He's able to do it. But we need to approve of that which is excellent and come out from that which is unclean and that's speaking of false teachers and discern between truth and error uh, and be washed with the washing of the water of the word and that is not work sanctification it's renewal in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his love for us being perfected in the love of God so that we may have confidence and boldness in the day of judgment that's why most of the epistles were written they're all unto that point you can go look up all the verses in each epistle where Paul referenced the rapture of the church and yes it's a motivating goal for his labor but his labor is for the conscience to be perfected so that we can stand rejoicing and not shrinking back um, so I've said this a million times in a di million different ways on my channel and really this is only this is the only message I have Somebody said, you know, you say a lot of different things, but it's always one thing. And that's exactly right. It's very simple. I only have one message. And by the grace of God, I've never deviated from it. Um, you know, some people want to judge me because they think, oh, well, now he's in the flesh. Now he's motivating. You know, now he's uh, operating in pride. Now he's, that's flesh. That's false humility. That's social media, narcissism, whatever. You know, they get all alarmed. Uh, I'm actually not operating any differently than I've ever operated on this channel. I'm exactly who I've always been. God leaves the weakness of the vessel intact, and that offends some people. Every person I know who has a ministry that's genuinely being used to the Lord, and I know them pretty well, I know their weaknesses. Paul said to the church of Galatia, you know, uh, the temptation in my flesh could have been a burden to you, but you received me in my weakness as an angel of God. We don't know what that temptation was, but Paul never claimed to be spiritual in the sense of uh, not being, being like super virtuous. I mean, he tried to conduct himself in a way that was worthy of the gospel. And, uh, but he, like, for example, he said he spared the church in Corinth by not coming to them because he was afraid that there would be outbursts because they were tempting him to vindicate his ministry and he's afraid of the flesh. He said he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to buffet him because of the abundance of revelation so that he wouldn't be overly puffed up or exalted because knowledge puffs up. He didn't say, I've overcome pride and I'm humble. No, it's not that we have overcome our faults. We still have our faults. But we know how to keep coming to Jesus and we stay on message. That's why God can use us. And in fact, I was talking to somebody today about it. Yeah, we have our faults, but God actually uses the faults and that's why he has to leave them there. Because in every case, our weakness is also our strength. You know, you might think I'm obnoxious, but that's actually what... Uh, I use or God uses to enable me to stay on point and not be moved. You know, my message will not change. Thank God by the mercy. Of, and I know that's the mercy of the Lord. I'm not boasting in that, but there's a thick headedness about me and a stubbornness and a refusal to listen to the enemy anymore, you know, but part of that is because, you know, 
I am so unbendable and narrow in certain areas and rigid uh, in certain areas. Uh, there's other people who they're so nice that they give everybody the benefit of the doubt and they stay involved with people way too long. Okay. It takes them a long time to see how somebody's operating. And then finally months later, they finally go, Oh my gosh, that person, my like, man, I told you what they were doing, you know? Uh, but they stay, but God uses that too. Like Paul and Barnabas, you know, Paul couldn't take Mark on that missionary journey. He must have known something. But Barnabas said, no, we got to take him. Barnabas wanted to be nice. They had a fight to the where they had to split over it, you know. Uh, the point being that we have different dispositions that allow us to stay with different people so that everybody gets carried along, you know. And we all need to be who we are. But what we look for is not what someone's personality is like and whether or not we see moral failings and flaws. I mean, yes, if we see someone in open sin defrauding the saints, corrupting the word, adulterating it, and changing the doctrine, that needs to be called out. But a splinter in the eye is, I see a moral weakness in somebody. You know, that's... It, the, the, what you look at then is, okay, are they on message? The, the people I've stayed friends with, that I've made friends with that have channels... The reason they're my friends is not because they're the nicest people or because I like them the most. It's because I know no matter what, they're staying on message. I can trust them. That they're not moving away from their principle. They're not moving away from the gospel. I never have to worry about that. You know, I think of Greg Jackson, Petra, uh, Be Still and No, Nolan, uh, Nick C., uh, I mean, I could name a whole bunch of people, uh, and, and don't get your feelings hurt if I'm not naming you. You know, we are all very different people, but what we have in common when it comes to our ministry is that not a single one of us is going to budge, you know, from the gospel. And ultimately we make our decisions about who we circulate with based on where they stand on the truth. Period. Uh, there's now sometimes there is some like it's okay now. How far? How far do they need to go before we say that's too much? You know, sometimes peop, there's an open door like Apollos, Aquila, and I have to talk about this. Sorry, but Aquila and Priscilla, right? They heard Paul's gospel, were converted. Then Apollos came into town. Apollos only knew the baptism of John, and the Book of Acts says. That he was mighty in the scriptures and knew the way of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. Well, that means that they didn't. He did not know anything about identification truths, and he was preaching uh, baptism and that the law doesn't work to justify. Um, don't you remember? You all had to go out to the Jordan. That proves that the temple system is not how we're justified. And Jesus is the Lamb of God. He probably knew that. Did he know he was risen? Probably. But did he know that we've been regenerated with a new life, that Christ is now our life? We've been crucified with him. We're made members of the body of Christ. We're no longer Israel. We're part of the church, and God's interested in building up the church. No, he probably preached what John preached. You know, uh, do righteousness. Uh, give your cloak if they ask you for a... Uh, one thing, give them two, you know, kind of thing. Um, so Aquila and, and Priscilla heard his message. He wasn't against the truth, but he wasn't up to date. He spoke the old language. So they invited him over to dinner to talk about it. And he was open. And they helped him see more fully what Paul had been teaching to bring him up to date. Then they sent him to the churches with admonitions. I think he went to Corinth. Now, an admonition means, hey, receive this brother. Uh, an admonition is like, you may not receive him. Why? Because he's clearly not up to date. He doesn't speak the lingo. Okay? Uh, he still talks about repenting of sins. Uh, but he's not an enemy of the truth. He's behind, but he's... And you know what? He was a huge help 
to the church in Corinth with dealing with the Jews. Because the Corinthian church was Gentiles, and they had these Judaizers attacking them. Apollos was able to put them to bed with his knowledge of their scriptures, even though he wasn't 100% up to date with Paul's revelation. So he learned from them, and he was very useful to the Lord uh, to help defend that church from the attack from the Judaizers. So we have to recognize those kind of opportunities. If they're not for us, they're against us. Uh, if they're not against us, they're for us. And there are times when, you know, a wolf is someone who not only are they not up to date in their language, but they refuse the truth, argue against it, and then accuse you of looking for a license to sin. Okay. But there are opportunities that the Lord is opening up with channels that have been in a totally different world. They've not been part of this conversation for the last four years. They have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, they still use language that we would have used four years ago. Sanctification by faith? What are you talking about? Rewards? We haven't even talked about that yet. You know, we're still, we agree on justification, but we haven't gone much further to talk about these other things that actually when you're talking about sanctification, what we really should say is being renewed and here's why. And you start talking about Christ in you. And yet there's an open door where there can actually be a conversation and there's a mutual admiration and appreciation where I know that this person's being used to the Lord in the gospel and it's having fruit. You know, Apollos was being used and Priscilla and Aquila could recognize it. He was mighty in the scriptures and he knew the way of the Lord. Uh, what if when they had him over for dinner, somebody saw that and they said, oh, they're selling out. What is it? Because Apollos, all these people listen to Apollos and they just want to be popular. So they're associating themselves with him, questioning his motives, questioning their motives. So I've got a couple opportunities like that going on. And people are, who are close to me even are questioning my motives because they think that somebody didn't use the same language we did, therefore, you know. And, it, and what it really shows is that the people who are questioning these things don't understand the language itself, you know. And you can't explain to them, no, that's not what they said. No, they didn't backload work. No, that's not what that is. You're making a mountain out of a molehill, uh, you know, and now you're going off and, and all upset but we're going to see some things like that. Wow, how did this come up? <laughs> well, this is what's going on, you know. Um, so, there are times when you're not dealing with an antichrist or a wolf. You're dealing with somebody who's very much open to the truth. But the rancor and the environment uh, is not conducive, you know, for speaking it to them in a conversation. You got to take them aside. Um, and that's tragic, but we still have to keep contending. You know, uh, oh, the point being that, oh, I said I've stayed on message and I've not, I've been very careful. I've not associated with any, actually, I'm not affiliated with anyone. Uh, I've not deviated from the message and I only choose to, to stay friends, close friends with people who do not move from that message. And they know that. Okay, but then there are times when I'm talking to somebody who there's an open door. The enemy wants to mess that up too, you know. Um, so uh, that's too bad. That does not mean I'm deviating from the message. We just recognize the difference between an Apollos and a wolf. The wolves are the ones who misrepresent everything you say, you speak to them once or twice, you, you figure out that they're twisting your words, then you see them on two other walls lying about what you said do, and then doing videos. Uh, and eventually they get to a point where they say that you're using gra grace as a license to sin. Once they've done that, they show that they're taking the way, they're like Cain. Whether they're a believer or not, it doesn't even matter. I'm done. And a lot of people give me trouble for that. Like, you're just too strict and you're not loving people and you've created this huge environment where everybody's... No, I do expect people, hopefully, to be mature enough to know the difference between a wolf 
and someone who's just doesn't use the same language and doesn't know yet. Watch their behavior. Are they going to lie to you? Are they going to twist your words? Are they accusing you left and right? There's people who do use our language and yet accuse you left and right. And no matter what you say, they're going to accuse you of something else. Doesn't matter that they use the same language. Something's not right there. Their tail's sticking out of the costume or, or they just need to, to get renewed. Uh, okay. I think I've spoken about everything I need to speak about on this message. But I just, I, how did I start this? I, I wanted to say I'm, I'm working on Romans. That'll be done. First John, I think, in Romans will be done in the next, I don't know, I, probably by end of March. It's a lot of work, but I'm excited about it. And I just wanted to, I was so enjoying First John today. And so much being brought back to the focus of this channel. I'm like, wow, what God has done and why he's doing it is awesome. And I want to share it. So, and I've got a whole bunch of new subs. So this helps uh, to re-encapsulate what we're doing here and why. All right, take care.